So if you, you know, obviously consider and compare it to multifamily, we're not <laughs> like for the, the amount of value we get value adding the CapEx uh, and the cosmetics of a facility. It's nothing compared to some of the upgrades my, you know, friends and you guys are doing with, 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 with tenants and toilets and floors and countertops. I mean, we go in there and we feel great and like, wow, look at what we've done, but it's really not a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, the other part of the value add is the operations, right? So we're going in, usually buying from a mom and pop owner that's owned the facility for 30 years, something like that. They don't really understand the value of being on Google Maps, getting Google reviews, having an online presence, being able to automate the facility where somebody can rent a unit without even making a phone call, right? So that's an online rental um, and really streamlining the whole rental process, how you find, how we're found on the on uh, online uh you know, uh, the, the name of the game was self storage pretty much is if somebody's on a phone or a computer and they're looking for storage, if you pop up, so first, glad you went down that route and that, you know, especially look folks, whether, I mean, this show, Cameron, we have pretty even split of, you know, those who claim themselves as a passive investor or some, some level of operator. And I think it's even more important folks, for those of you who are investing passively into someone else to get education and, and, you know, either whether it's hire a coach or, or just make sure you're making informed decisions because, you know, it's one thing to go and do deals and, you know, get partially educated and figure it out along the way. That's good. You will learn. You'll, you'll, you're going to pay for your mistakes, whether it's real mistakes or whether it's education, you're going to learn. Right. But if you are, you know, investing passively, I think it's even more important that you that you make sure you're taking action and educating yourself like you're doing if you're here today so you're listening to the real estate runway podcast powered by quattro capital where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth here's your host the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor chad sutton All right, all right, all right, Real Estate Runway family. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm joined today with Cameron Barsanti. Cameron is a fantastic self-storage investor. We're going to talk a little bit about that asset class today. But first, let's get to know him. Cameron, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, brother? Hey, Chad. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm fired up to be here. Uh, you got a great podcast and uh, yeah, looking, looking forward to chatting self-storage with you. So oh, I'm, I'm excited, man. Glad to have you on. Glad for this educational opportunity. So folks, whether you're an operator or an investor, this is going to be something you don't want to miss. Let's get into it with your story first. So uh, tell me about how you got into this world a little bit. You know, why real estate and eventually why uh, self-storage? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was in, uh, it really started uh, not too long ago, about four and a half years ago. Uh, my wife and I, we were in LA. We had our second kid on the way. I was, um, I was an, basically an unemployed actor, um, <laughs> not very exciting. Uh, I was writing screenplays. I was collecting unemployment. I think I made like six grand that year, a whopping 6K. Um, my, I was, my wife was very upset at me. Um, I, <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, the out of work actor writing screenplays. I had actually just lost her uh, life savings in a feature film that I made. Um, so I was, yeah, absolutely in the doghouse. And uh, um, thankfully, the, the the smart one of the two of us, you can imagine who that you can guess who that is. Um, uh, she basically started listening to podcasts on real estate and her her wise old father was elderly father basically had had told her her whole life that multifamily was a great way to or what she would want to do eventually. So we knew that eventually we were going to get into real estate. What we didn't know is how we were going to do it. And I think as you, uh, as we, I think the, the biggest kind of, the thing that people don't necessarily get taught is that you can actually start investing without a lot of capital. Right. And so we were one of the many that didn't know that. And so when she started listening to podcasts like yours and, and others and bigger pocket pockets and you name it, she quickly understood and learned that we could actually start investing with little to no money. And so for us, that was our first big cornerstone, uh, uh, learning and understanding, hey, look, we actually can potentially start getting into this real estate game now. Um, so she basically sat me down, 
slapped me around a little bit <laughs> uh, more emotionally and verbally than physically and basically said, you're going to stop doing everything you're doing and you're going to start do you're going to start doing this. And that was basically start listening and understanding and learning the games of real estate investing. And so I was very obedient. I, I uh, understood exactly what I needed to do. I I dropped everything and full time started pursuing real estate. So um, her and I both started consuming everything we could, right? Educating ourselves, uh, uh, take, tucking the kids in, watching stuff at night. Um, and we were very serious about it. We were very inspired and uh, very quickly just started making moves. So the first thing we did was I was going to start wholesaling. We didn't really have any money. So we pulled out $90,000 of equity in our house. That was our entire really, uh, that was all the money we could kind of scrounge to start. And then we started buying real estate. We bought a triplex in Texas. We bought an 11 unit in New Mexico. And then our first facility was three years ago. And that was a bank owned self storage facility that we stumbled upon. Uh, I was under contract. I hired a coach, a self storage coach. We used to have a, 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 a multifamily coach. The one, one of the, the good things we did uh, throughout the whole process is we always had somebody who, we always had a mentor or a coach. So we were, were always expediting the process by learning from somebody who was actually, you know, uh, very successful at it. And so, Hired a guy, bought our first facility, and in the last three years, we've acquired over forty million in uh, self storage. We're in six states currently, um, uh, closing on our thirteenth facility in actually Guam um, in the next three wow. weeks. Yeah, yeah, wild. Uh, where my wife's from, and uh, and now that's what we do full time is we own and operate self storage uh, nationwide. Yeah, that's incredible. And so you know, you said something there that you you kind of glossed over because it's second nature to you, but. You know, talk about the importance of taking action on what you learn on, but all, what you're learning, but also, you know, how to take like the importance of a coach, right? Because you can, you can take uninformed action or uneducated action and get yourself in a lot of trouble really quickly. So, you know, how did you balance that? Yeah, great question. Um, you, you said it, Chad, it's, it really is, um, uh... I think one of the hardest and most important things is just to take an action, right? And so what I find is actually a lot of people that I talk to already have quite a bit of knowledge and education, whether it's multifamily, single family, you know, flip land, whatever, uh, self-storage. They've learned a lot. They've gathered stuff from podcasts, books, maybe taken some classes, but it's the action part that is actually the most difficult. And it's not necessarily their fault. It's not because they're not action takers, but it's that... They just don't quite understand how to start moving the needle forward, right? And I think for, it doesn't have to be the same for anybody, but something really funny happened to us. And not, not funny, but I think the unique thing about us is because I was desperate. My wife was upset. <laughs> um, we saw this massive opportunity. And so we, we actually educated ourselves from many different uh from, from many different resources, including a coach, but also online meetups, books, podcasts. So we were really aggressive with the education that we consumed. But what I tell everybody, it's like the education, you know, obviously that's really important. It's, it's kind of like your commitment, right? You, you start committing. It's like when people start going to the gym in January, it's like everybody's like committed to their new year's resolution, right. but the, the commitment dwindles, right? So for us in retrospect, what we thankfully did was we found ways to not only commit, but then we continue to kind of feed that commitment, right? That momentum. And our biggest momentum was when we pulled equity out of our house. And all of a sudden, my wife's like, you got to find a deal. We're paying interest on that, right? And it was a ticking clock. And what we continued to do was always up the stakes, put ourselves in situations we had to get ourselves out of. And so I actually, I help um, people across the country actually invest in self-storage. I'm a coach myself. But what I concentrate on most with people is one thing and that's actually a uh, deal flow and so going back to what you said chad is the action right the action the action the action and so what i find is most people that already have the education they're still a little bit fuzzy on how do i start moving the needle forward right like where do i take action what do i do and so my best advice is just concentrate on the deal 
learn how to not only obviously analyze, but learn how to find and source great deals. Because if you can do that, you'll literally have the keys to the kingdom. Whether you're in multifamily, single family, if you can become a great deal hunter or partner with one, everything else will follow, right? As you know, capital, partners, all that. And so all we did from the very beginning is we got great at finding deals. And because of that, we've been able to leverage capital, leverage partners, leverage uh, opportunities. Um, and so I try and keep things really simple for people, literally only the deal, because if you have 40 facilities or you have zero facilities, we're both, you, you, you share the same obstacle. And the obstacle is you can only scale as fast as the good deals you can find. I hope that answers your question. That, that answers my question and more. I'm so glad you went down that route and that, you know, especially look folks, whether, I mean, this show, Cameron, we have pretty even split of, you know, those who claim themselves as a passive investor or some, some level of operator. And I think it's even more important folks, for those of you who are investing passively into someone else to get education and, and, you know, either whether it's hire a coach or, or just make sure you're making informed decisions because, you know, it's one thing to go and do deals and, you know, get partially educated and figure it out along the way. That's good. You will learn. You'll, you'll, you're going to pay for your mistakes, whether it's real mistakes or whether it's education, you're going to learn. Right. But if you are, you know, investing passively, I think it's even more important that you, that you make sure you're taking action and educating yourself like you're doing if you're here today. So I love that. And, and to transition, you know, into some of the meat of today, Cameron, you know, you, you mentioned in our early conversation that, you know, you, you were in multifamily for a little while, or you, you at least explored it for a while and, and you wound up choosing self-storage and, and anyone who's listened to this show, you know, that we Quattro, we are primarily multifamily players. We did it before. It was cool. We love it. We'll always do it. It's a great investment. There are other types of vehicles out there, and we talk about them on the show. Self-storage being another unit. I kind of group them into unit-based versus square footage-based, right? So you have your warehouses, your office space, all that kind of stuff, your retail space, which is typically priced per square foot. And then you come over here and you have mobile home parks and you have self-storage and you have apartments. And these are all kind of priced by the unit. You sign a, a unit-based lease, right? And so I think they have a lot of similarities. But what attracted you? to the self storage space, you know, over the multifamily space. Maybe speak to that a little bit and let's yeah. kind of play with that. Yeah, totally. Um it was interesting because you you said you were in multifamily before it was cool. And so <laughs> I can't even imagine what that looked like, right? Because <laughs> because when I started it, it was seven and eight caps. It was great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Positive leverage. <laughs> totally. So when we started I was in LA at the time and we were going to meetups with 60 people and like 50 of them were syndicating multifamily. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it was like everybody in, in the world was, it felt like a syndicator. And so I think for us, we were excited about the opportunity and I love multifamily. Well, we still own a couple of fourplexes and uh, I'm sure eventually we'll diversify back into multifamily. It's never going anywhere as we know. Right. Um, and so uh, we were excited about the opportunity that we were understanding leverage and that we got, we we're going to start getting to invest in real estate without, you know, being able to, you know, have all the capital to do so. Um, but I don't think I was like, it wasn't like, oh, multifamily, I have this huge attraction to it. I think I just had an attraction to the opportunity. And I, I think typically by nature, I'm sometimes more attracted to often more attracted to like maybe the stuff that's not talked about as much. And so for me, I was kind of like, you know, grew up in a small town and I'm like, yeah, yeah. But like, what about mobile home parks, you know, or like trailer parks? I wasn't even calling them mobile home parks. <laughs> and or what about storage? Just because I was fascinated. I, I wasn't hearing a lot about it. One of the first actually investors I ever met was Ryan Smith, uh, Elevation Capital, huge storage guy. And so that kind of like turned my head towards it right away. And so then as, you know, fate would have it, you know, the fact that by pounding the phone, looking for off-market multifamily, I came across a bank-owned self-storage facility. And luckily at that time, I had a partner that was, you know, 28-year season investor. I gave him a call and I'm like, man, yeah, I found this, you know, facility. It's like 50,000 square feet and 
it's partially converted and it's on like six acres. And he's like, buy it. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, dude, buy it. He's like, I, I used to be in storage. He's like, I'm like, it's, you know, X amount. He's like, buy it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, you know, and it was so, there was a lot of luck to it. But then when during due diligence, I started learning the game, right? A friend and partner of mine, AJ Osborne has his own uh, self-storage podcast, really the only self-storage podcast out there. Um, and I learned like 10 hours of storage on a road trip and I was all in. Like it was for me, it was like, you know what? I don't know, man, something about this. I see the opportunity it makes sense, not being talked about a whole lot. And, uh, and I just never looked back. Yeah. I love that. And so, so since then, you know, you, you've, you've definitely learned the game. You've bought like 13 of these puppies in a couple of years. Right. So tell me about, you know, kind of, um, what does it take to, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of courses out there, right. That teach how sexy it is to buy real estate and you get really good at buying real estate. But then what some people don't realize is you actually have to run the real estate after you buy it. You, know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to make it operate well. It's not a passive investment. So, you know, tell me a little bit about how, you know, you have figured out like, what are the, what are the main strategies and, and, and areas of focus? Like when you're running not just one, but 13 storage facilities, you know, what, what does your operation look like? How are you managing them? How are you collecting rent? You know, all that kind of stuff. Let's kind of walk that route a little bit of what, it, what does it look like? Uh, yeah, another great question, Chad. So of the, uh, so we're closed on a number 13. We've actually sold uh, two recently. We're under contract to sell three more. And so our operations were getting to a point where we thought we'd have to expand more. Um, and instead, we're at a good spot now. We have an operational manager. We, we have mainly remote kind of uh, offsite manager slash call center employees. Um, and we are remote managing most of our facilities, right? So if you get above, usually, I mean, this is just rough it rough it it varies but around 60,000 square feet a lot of times you're at a point where you got a big enough facility where you need somebody on site full time we do have facilities at large they're not all having uh, they do not all have a full time on site manager just kind of depends but we've gotten very good at at keeping everything in house for now and so I, again i have an operator uh, my partner and i his my partner's wife is the uh, our cfo she does all of really the financials and the books and the payroll um my partner and i oversee every uh uh every facility my partner is basically he's great at the 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 contracts the negotiating when we go to sell he's a broker owns his own brokerage himself very savvy on that side i'm more the deal finder and then also like the guy that you know keeps the team together the employees happy stuff like that so we're a good kind of mix on that end and then we have people answering the phone that are like uh, they're running like three to four facilities a piece for the most part they work from home they love their job um they answer the phones they we have somebody on site who walks the facility once a week checks for locks make sure people you know make sure everything every unit has a lock on it make sure nobody's moved out without telling us make sure there wasn't a break in anything weird trash stuff like that and it's a very kind of lean and mean machine i think our our average you know expense uh ratio uh once we've stabilized the asset is around 25 percent yeah, that's, that's really lean and mean. So that, that's, that's kind of good that you can do that. And, um, you know, thinking through, so it, it's a little different than, you know, somewhere people are living, right? As you're, as you're hearing folks, you have people who store their stuff there. And so I'm assuming that, you know, so you have to, you have to have a little bit of personnel. Obviously you said call center, the fact that you use that word, it's a lot more about, you know, fielding prospects. I'm sure you do some marketing, you field these prospects and you have to get them closed, get them in. So, so what kind of turnover do these buildings typically expect? Is it similar to, you know, 50% per year on an apartment or something else? Uh, man, that's a great question. I wish I had the stats in front of me. Uh, I, 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 I believe it's around, and I should know this, I believe it's closer to like you know, 80% that stay over six months, there's usually a breakdown. It's like, you know, 30% stay within six months, six to 12 months. It's an, it's maybe it's another 30 and then it's, you know, at, over 12 months is your remainder 20 or 30%, something like that. I don't have turnover stats in front of me, but one thing I'll say is that it definitely varies from property to property for us. For example, we own a facility down in Southern New Mexico that's a, uh, right next to a big air force base. Uh, 
the turnover on that is a little bit different because we have a lot of people that are putting their stuff in for six to 12 months and then deploying. Um, whereas if you're in, in a college town uh, or city, you're getting typically a lot more turnover just because it's college students, uh, a little bit more, uh, a uh, little more uh, reflection of the seasons with the college area too. Obviously nobody's really around in the summertime, stuff like that. Um, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I wish I had better stats for you, but um, what I what I can tell you just in quick observation across our portfolio is uh, every facility is a little different depending on the market it's in. Yeah, so you kind of drove the point, so I get it. There, there's kind of a spread of who stays six months to a year, but it sounds like a about every year everyone's turning over. So that's that's that hence the call center, hence the you know the the must refill the tenants, you know. Um, and so let's talk about adding value a little bit, right? So you, you, do you typically buy these things with the intent to, you know, you mentioned stabilize, so I'm assuming you're adding some kind of value to them. What does that look like to, you know, to add value to a self-storage facility? Yeah. Uh, so we are definitely value add investors. Um, we're adding value definitely to every facility we're buying. Um, usually it's a little bit or a lot of CapEx. Um, we've, We've had a great run at just buying deep discounted properties. And so most of the time, the deep discount come with a a rundown property. So CapEx usually will include at least uh, uh, automating the gate, probably a new keypad that syncs with our software, um, typically upgrading lights, cameras. We usually go in and we repaint the whole facility. We have a great painter that does it at a pretty deep discount. And so we're, it's amazing what a paint can do to, you know, a warehouse and garage doors. Um, We'll add new signage. A lot of time, half the time, we'll have to do some asphalt repair or complete like chip coat uh, uh, resurface. Um, uh, Some of the time, depending if if the uh, entire property is fenced, if we add a fence to the whole perimeter uh and that's that's about it right so sometimes there's springs and latches and stuff like that so if you you know obviously consider and compare to multifamily, we're not <laughs> like for the the amount of value we get value adding the capex uh, and the cosmetics of a facility it's nothing compared to some of the upgrades my you know friends and you guys are doing with 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 tenants and toilets and floors and countertops I mean, we go in there and we feel great and like, wow, look at what we've done, but it's really not a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, the other part of the value add is the operations, right? So we're going in, usually buying from a mom and pop owner that's owned the facility for 30 years, something like that. They don't really understand the value of being on Google Maps, getting Google reviews, having an online presence, being able to automate the facility where somebody can rent a unit without even making a phone call, right? So that's an online rental um, and really streamlining the whole rental process, how you find, how we're found on the, on uh, online, uh, you know, uh, the, the name of the game was self storage pretty much is if somebody's on a phone or a computer and they're looking for storage, if you pop up first, you win, right? That's kind of the name of the game. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and usually it's, it's not only pop up, but respond quickly, right? Nobody wants to sit around Absolutely. for two days waiting on someone to respond, you know, they'll go find a competitor. So totally. Yeah. And, and you had, you had, I'm sorry, Chad, I was gonna say you had mentioned something earlier when I mentioned call center, you know, the one point I, I think that's worth making is we actually, I call it a call center, but it's not, it's, it's the managers answering the phone and we've actually stayed away from the call center and third party management just because we feel we by being really hands on, we've been able to move and turn things over really quickly, right? So maybe an average turnover is more like six to twelve months for for a lot of the operators, maybe twelve to eighteen. We're we're going in there, moving stuff around really quickly, and trying to get three to six months everything completely turned around. We're answering the phone seven days a week because it's not a call center. Um, I've hired a call center one time and I called them and I'm like, Hey, nobody answered. And they're like, Oh, well, it's the weekends. You know, we're, we're short staffed. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> you said you answer the phone seven days a week, you know? So that was, those are the kind of things that by having our own in-house manager who loves their job that will answer the phone at set eight at night, if they have to, or the, somebody sends them a text at 9 PM saying, I'm looking for a unit. Uh, you know, we're able to take, take those calls, which has really been important for us. 
Yeah, that's super important. And, you know, I guess last question before we get to our final questions of the day, um, you know, you, you mentioned being, you know, being the deal guy, right? That finding deep discount deals is kind of the key to success. So, you know, wondering if you'd be willing to share with the audience a little bit, and maybe not specifics, but, you know, at least on general guidelines, what, what is your method? How do you find these, these uh, deep discount deals um, in the self-storage space? Yeah, happy to, happy to throw out some pointers here. And, you know, while we wrap this up, Chad, I want, you know, I mentioned it earlier, deal, fu deal funnel and, 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 you know, that I help people. But one thing that I'll, you know, I, I tell people three things and it's, 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 it's partnership, it's mentorship and it's deal flow. And that's the three things that really we've, you know, we stumbled upon early, right? We always had a coach by having a coach. We were able to expedite years and years of education into days, weeks, and months, right? So we basically learned from the best. And we not only learned how to play the game, but we learned where they were, were buying in, why they were buying in those markets, how they were structuring deals, everything, right? So literally learning from the pros at the very beginning of our career. And then our partners were the people that we didn't even know were coming, but all we had to do was bring partners or or uh, potential partners, great deals. And all of a sudden we had people that had been in the business for 20, 30 years partnering with the newbie just because we brought the deal. And so I really love to bundle these, these three things up. And when people come to me and they're like, oh, you know, I, I know about the business. I just don't know what to do. I literally am like partnership, mentorship, deal flow. Don't even worry about anything else. And so then buttoning that in, uh, up to the end of that was the deal flow. And so that's where it all started. And because I, we we're getting good at fetching these deals, I, we very quickly realized that, hey, look, we have the opportunity to bring people that have been in the business 20, 30 years, and they'll partner with a dummy like me because everybody wants a good deal, right? And so you asked the question, the deal flow for us, for the most part, has been cold calling. And so I... Uh, started in multifamily, like I said, and then I started a wholesale company for single family homes and I pounded the phones for years. And what that did is it, I got better at uh, talking to sellers on the phone uh, with storage. It's crazy because you and I right now, if, if Chad and Cameron spent 20 minutes together right now, I could probably get a hold of at least three self storage owners I've never talked to. And that's crazy, right? And that's mom and pop direct to the source. And so we're pounding the phones hard um, and we're, we're trying to get direct to seller, whether it's at the facility on their cell phone, we're doing some skip tracing. I have a whole virtual assistant team out of, um, uh, across the, 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 the planet that, that helped me out with all the acquisitions now and a full-time employee, Michael, who's a rock star. But we're, we're really primarily cold calling direct to seller as much as we possibly can. I do feel like that's getting more and more competitive right now. And so... You know, we'll send mailers from time to time, maybe send an email or two. Um, and the biggest, I think, without going down the, the, the rabbit hole too much on this, if I could give anybody the best tip, I would say that the game is played, the, the deal machine, the deal flow, I'll give you three quick tips. So it's, it's, it's being able to prioritize your leads appropriately, organize them efficiently, and follow up consistently. And so the, the where the real game is played for us is in the follow up game. The follow -up. So yeah. you learn how to start getting leads, but it's what you do with those leads that will set you apart. You got to figure out a way to to keep those leads not only organized, prioritizing which ones you should be following up on more than any of the others, and the follow up is crazy. I mean. You may have to call somebody for every day for five months and you don't want to be a pest, but most of the time they don't even know you were calling and they don't even say anything about it. But the follow up game is the key. So uh, wrapping it up with saying input versus output, the more sellers you talk to, the more opportunities you'll have. It's a numbers game, man. And, and the, the follow up is absolutely it. You know, it's great to make contact once, but usually... I'll tell you right now, if you call me asking me to sell my building, it's probably going to be a no right out, right out of the gate. If you call me <laughs> 50 right. times, I don't know. You might catch me at the right time when I'm frustrated with it and decide to sell. <laughs> That's right. That's how it goes. But um, I love that, man. So, let, you know, I want to kind of do our, our ending point here a little, a little backwards because 
you know, you, you do have a bit of an education program that, uh, that you offer to, to on the self storage side. So let's talk about that for a second and then let's hop to the last two questions. Three seconds. Cool. That sounds great. Um, like I mentioned, I did start my own program, uh, in, in actually January of this year. Um, I've already helped probably had eight or nine students already close deals. Uh, two reasons why I launched the program. One, I had been waiting to teach people my whole life uh, about something um, that was actually worthy. I, I taught some acting classes, but that, that didn't count, <laughs> nor did I really enjoy it that much, but uh, uh, appreciate it nonetheless. But no, I, I had something that I knew I could teach people and I love helping people out. And so um, the, 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 the biggest motivation behind my program was what I touched on earlier and that it was, I kept talking to people that had education and we're stuck. And what I quickly understood was nobody was helping these people actually start moving the needle forward. Where uh, storage life is the name of my 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 program. We're very action oriented. So I don't work with. I can teach people. I can teach you how to operate and everything you want to know about storage in about twenty four hours if we have it. In fact, and if we, if you, if you and I took a six hour meeting, I could teach you everything you needed to know for the most part, right. Other than actually doing it yourself because, but storage isn't rocket science. And once you buy a facility, you'll figure it out. You'll figure out everything else that nobody could teach you. But the hardest part is taking action consistently. So what I really, really, really help people with is making this thought, this idea, this concept of becoming an investor into an actual reality by building out a roadmap, understanding that you actually have to eliminate most of the other ideas and thoughts you have and focus only on a few key things to actually start making progress, progress, building out a roadmap, understanding that if you really want this to happen, you got to have things on your calendar, right? You got to start doing stuff on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that's going to, it's consistency and it's accountability, right? Consistency, accountability. And so you got to figure out ways. Once you know how to approach the business and what you should focus your time on, then it's a matter of making it actually a reality, right? Having it on your calendar, calling 10 sellers a day or whatever it is, where you actually start making again, this thought and this education and this kind of analysis paralysis, paralysis and actually just turning into a step-by-step -step process in order to actually start not only taking action, but, um, but actually uh, putting together, finding, putting de together deals and taking them down. I love that. So, so how do we find the, uh, the coaching program that we're talking about? Uh, it's actually just storagelife.com. So you can find me there. Uh, uh, I'm on Instagram. I don't, you know, so you can, that's the best place to find me and direct message me as well. People are happy to find me there at just storage life camp, C A M. Um, but yeah, you'll find everything you need to know and happy to talk to anybody just even if they're, you know, thinking about what to do next, or I love chat. I love talking storage. So happy to help anybody I can. I love it. I love it. So let's get to the last couple of questions and folks, storagelife.com will be right in the show notes for your clicking pleasure. So scroll down, check that out. And, uh, wow, this new Apple thing, I just did a thumbs up and it, okay. Technology surprises you even live <laughs> on the show. So here we go. And uh, last two questions, you know, first one, what is your superpower, Cameron, and how does it serve you well? Definitely hunting deals. Yeah. And so I love people. I love meeting new people. I love chatting with people. I feel like, you know, I've won the lottery being able to invest in storage and in real estate, like just something that nobody ever really taught me. I didn't know existed the way it does. And so I feel like I'm kind of looking for buried treasure every day from my house. And so being able to see my kids every day and uh, not, I don't, I hardly travel and being able to reach out at, at, to anybody potentially across the nation that may have a deal. And not only do I then have an opportunity to potentially buy the deal, but I have an opportunity to also uh, educate a seller because a lot of times sellers don't necessarily know what they want or how they can structure the deal to better benefit themselves and potentially us. And so I love, I love hunting deals down and that's the only way we've been able to scale as fast as we have. I love that. And like you said, it's one of the key pieces of growth there is, is deal flow. And so flipping the coin over last question of the day, Cameron, what is your biggest failure? It could be life or business and what'd you learn? Uh, 
I've never said this one, <laughs> but my biggest failure was probably, um, it was just in life. <laughs> um, I moved to Hollywood at 18. I had some big opportunities to work as an actor and I wasn't ready and I don't have any regrets. I never, I, I honestly believe it wasn't meant to be. And sometimes I hate that kind of phrase, that phrase, but it wasn't meant to be in so many different for so many different reasons. But I, in my head, I was trying hard for years, but ultimately I, I had went through about a crash and burns <laughs> to a decade of my life. And in my head, I always felt like I wanted to succeed. I knew I was going to be successful, but I actually didn't know how. And I went down a rabbit hole of thinking that the entertainment was the only thing I wanted to do, partly because I didn't know anything else that I wanted to do. And the reason I bring that up is because I'm sure I'm not the only one. I know we all have had failures or in current struggles in our life, but I went through over a decade of a lot of struggle. And yet I felt like somebody who was always like thought they were, you know, had a uh, great opportunities and great friends and great family, and yet just crashed and burned and struggled a lot. And a lot of it had to do with not being around the right people and not getting the right information. And so uh, from 20 to 30, that, that was my biggest failure. <laughs> I love that. Well, Cameron, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, folks. Check out storagelife.com to check out all the cool things Cameron and his team are doing at his company, as well as the coaching program we alluded to. I assume that's also the best way to get in touch with you, Cameron, is through the website. Through the website, or uh, you can find me on Instagram too, Storage Life Cam, uh, C A M. Uh, and yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. Happy to help. I love it. Well, folks, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. Until next time, over and out. Thanks, Jeff. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.